Uh, hello and welcome to another edition of a uh, brand new podcast. That's Paul Ricketts, my co-host. I'm Steve Gribbin. Uh, we're both comedians who've been uh, playing on the comedy circuit for blah, 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 blah years. Mm, yeah. And this is our podcast in which we interview uh, promoters. But um, we uh, have decided to ask, you know, what their motivation, etc. and vision is. And the podcast itself is called You Should Have Been Here Last Week. And um, we, we should explain this, Paul. Well, it's it's quite a simple explanation. Uh, you know, there's many occasions. Uh, it's like a Pirandello play. Hidden Pirandello play. Three comics in search of a gig. And, you, know, <laughs> you turn up and you get to this place. You might have driven uh, 300, 400 miles to get there. And uh, you turn up at the place and there's no audience. Uh, there's just nothing but furniture, uh, empty. And the promoter will come up to you and say, well, oh, should have been here last week. It was absolutely mobbed. Mobbed last week, it was. <laughs> I've no idea why that's meant to make you feel better, because it normally just utterly depresses you, doesn't it? You think, well, yeah. Oh. You think, well, wait a minute, am I just one week behind in every one of my bookings? What, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, well, if it keep on, keeps on happening regularly, there must be a pattern, yeah. So today's guest is a very special guest indeed. It's a guy called Peter Graham, who is the promoter behind uh, the old King's Head. Downstairs Cabaret. at the old Downstairs King's at the King's Head, yes. Uh, um, which is, it is claimed, is the oldest comedy club in Britain. But, uh, Paul, you don't think it is, do you? No, I don't think it is. But I, I think in the interview, I think Peter deals with this subject. He does indeed. Uh, and it actually is the subject of a brand new film which is uh, being released uh, called indeed The Oldest Comedy Club in Britain featuring people like Stuart Lee and uh, loads of other people. <laughs> yeah, more <laughs> famous comedians than us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, the kind of we, people that play... We know. need a director of the film yeah. and he didn't contact us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Peter Graham's got some actually uh, very, very funny stories on uh, his experiences of being a promoter, uh, which do indeed stretch for about 43 years. Um, so he's, he's he's probably the the longest in the tooth promoter that we interview in, in all these podcasts, I, I would say. There's not many people been doing it longer than 43 years, is there? There's a few, actually. There's one that he mentions that we are going to interview, but we'll, ah. we'll let the interview play out. Yes. We'll let it play out. Here he is. Obviously, we have a you know an esteemed esteemed promoter and club runner to, uh, today. It's a Peter Graham, uh, Peter Walsingham Graham. What is your real name, Peter? Because yeah. I've never worked it out. All right. Well, I mean, obviously, esteemed means old. So we've, yes, we've of course. That out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, my real name is Peter Walsingham, mm. but mm. my dad, who's a musician, and there's a story. Yeah, it's sort of old showbiz stories going way back. He his name is Alan Graham Walsingham, but he was fed up with Walsingham being misspelt, so he used his middle name mm. as a professional name. And when I started out as a musician, a lot of people knew me as his son, so they automatically wrote the checks, yeah. all of which bounced mm. to uh, Graham. And you are the runner, the person behind the uh, can also say esteemed. Uh, downstairs at the King's Head Comedy Club in uh, Crouch End, mostly pronounced by MCs as Cruz Sean in your That's corner. right. Uh, a co-founder, co co really, with Hugh Thomas, yep. which some of your less esteemed listeners, a younger, will remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I remember yeah, it. So we've been, yeah, we've been there a long time, and, uh, and Hugh sort of left, his uh, comparing duty, he was regular compare there in uh, just before the turn of the century. I won't say which century, uh, because <laughs> uh, he got a chest infection, which we were frightened was more serious than it was. But mm. that we was assumed at the time had come from, you know, the room being full of smoke and, and, uh, and me as well. That's a lot of people who meet me get ill. <laughs> He's some sort of necromancer. Yes. Yeah, but a slow one. 
It's been in close contact with you in that little back room that you sort of live in. I know. And you used to have straight hair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether you're going to cover this in this short time, but I've been quite ill over the last year, and yeah. uh, and as a result, um, Georgina in particular has been covering for me at the club, and I get all these reports back from comics saying it wasn't the same in that room because Georgina was being nice to me. <laughs> No, I was just thinking I was even going to start this podcast with you know, the most famous sentence that you say to Axe is let's get this whole grim business over and done with. As quickly as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can go home. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's show business. So why did you become a comedy promoter? I mean, it wasn't careers advisor, was it? Well, I mean, well, how did that happen? No, I, I was at Middlesex Poly, as was, and Hugh was one of my teachers. He'd seen a bit of this new stand-up you know, sort of uh, scene emerging in the late 70s and had been on stage at the, the infamous Gong, Gong Show at the, um, uh, at the Comedy Store with Alexis Sale as the regular compare. And he liked the whole vibe of it, but didn't like the sort of full ring, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you get gonged off for, for failure. He wanted yeah. a room that was a bit more encouraging and nurturing and found this place in Crouch End um, underneath the pub and put on a show and asked me to help out as a, you know, as one of his students or post students, because after I left, I mean, Hugh's a lovely guy and a great, presenter but he's not a great organizer uh, and so after one gig he said can you just do the, the administrative side of things and making sure the mics work and whatever so i that was our relationship for for 20 odd years doing that club he'd be the front man you know centering the shows hosting the shows and i would be in the sound room and sticking bits of paper together and set as was the case then before the internet. Oh, God, In fact, yeah. it was before electricity. Mm. It, it <laughs> yeah, those, those early posters look like those blackmail notes that used to get yeah, sent to the newspapers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if you want to see your grandmother again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I well remember Hugh um, comparing down there with them, um, and he used to do um, a brilliant version of the routine that he sold to Alexi Sale, didn't he? Yeah, there's a funny story because, it, and I'm sure this happens to a lot of people who sell their own routines, is it was the race around the Watford bypass was yeah. the routine. And, and and Lexi had seen it and said, I'd like to have that. And and uh, Hugh sold it to him for whatever it was. And on one proviso, I said, as long as I can do it in my own club, you know. And then... He started getting complaints because people were saying, you've nicked that off the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Following him around the club. Oh, no. <laughs> so how did you actually, in those early days, how did you go about um, getting the axe? There was somebody in the area, a guy called Ivor Dembina, who oh, yeah. already started a place a, a year or so before around... And he was very, very um, generous with giving me a few telephone numbers to start off with, you know. That was really the very first person who sort of helped me with, you know, was kind enough to give me some connections. And, it, and at the same time, there were other things happening that, you know, I had sort of feelers with as well with Cast New Variety, who were at Wood Green, or one of their sites was there with Roland and Claire. Mm. I mean, there were very few clubs at that point. And strangely enough, you know, there were three or four within hitting distance of Crouch End. You had Cast at Wood Green, you had Red Rose at Finsbury Park, you had Earth Exchange up at uh, Highgate. So, you know, there was a small mixture. And there was stuff coming off the street as well, you know, street entertainers at Covent Garden. There was just a funny little sort of network of uh, uh, pubescent acts, you know. <laughs> I mean, what, what's giving you the most amount of pleasure from booking a comedy? What would you... Money. <laughs> right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, what's the most, what's the most you've ever made? Just, just think about that. No, what about, know, what's, I... what's the most you've ever paid is the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking this year I might put it up a bit. 
but uh, that'd be the first time since 81. Mm. But um, the, I make about £15,000 uh, a year out of that place. You know, for me, so it's 300 quid a week over the year, you know. Mm. So it's not a big money spin. I'm lucky enough to have earned money doing other stuff. You know, prostitution, £8 last year doing that. <laughs> and, uh, it's gone up there. Hand that as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which hand? <laughs> yeah, <depends. laughs> yeah, so it's never been a thing about money. It's something I enjoy doing. And I've often said to people, I've never had to sign on. And when I haven't got work elsewhere, it's paid the bills, you know. Um, uh, and we, the other thing, I know people tease us about it, but we do other stuff there. We do music. We've got a very good setup for sound and broadcast there, which we invest in. We never give the comics good microphones because they abuse them. All comics do that thing where they sort of do this all the time when they're chatting, they don't realise, so yeah. yanking it around, yeah. slamming it down. So I give all the comics bad gear and we hide all the good stuff. Well, don't mm. forget, by the way, Terry Alderson used to put it in, I used to hate that coming on yeah. after him. He used to put yeah. it in his mouth, go, oh, and then put it back on the stand, and then you'd have to do. Oh my god! I know, oh, but then Hugh used to put a recorder up his ass, and I didn't like using that one after. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what what would give you the most aggravation then in putting on a comedy night? What's what's oh audience? I just yeah, we shouldn't have audiences really. I don't like them, and uh, <laughs> no, uh, it's it's always the it's usually the idiot in the audience who thinks it's about them. And that, that idiot has changed over the years. You know, it would have been drunk lads, and now it's more often 50-year-old women on a night out, been on the Prosecco since five. Yeah. Very difficult to deal with because they mm. know more than you've ever known in your life. Yeah. And, and um, I'm very careful about who the host is. And if you have the right host, you, uh, you have less chance of, of trouble. It's difficult to shout at some hosts, you know, you're, you're looking the idiot, you know. So, mm. so the difficulty is get dealing with usually sing, single drunk women at the moment, but that's yeah. changed over the years and will change again probably. You know. if I usually have female staff and, you know, working the door and if I'm not there, it'd be all female. They're much better at dealing with that because obviously I'm in a difficult position with manhandling, mm. which is what – would have happened in the old days actually bundling somebody out but you can't yeah. do it, you know as i found out mm. <laughs> <laughs> i mean that leads us on to it what what tips would you give to anybody that wants to be a comedy promoter yeah to a promoter oh, okay, sorry not right okay put the chairs facing the stage <laughs> No, that is really good advice that a lot of people do not realise. Don't laugh at that. Yeah. That is crucial information. Invest in some lights and yeah. a, a microphone that isn't going through a an Argos home uh, entertainment set, you know. Think about the the focus of the show, which is the stage. And, and then if you work backwards from that, you should make all the right decisions. But people just don't think. The amount of times I've put gigs on for council-run theatres and stuff, and every week I have to tell them, don't put round tables in them, because by definition, a quarter of the audience are going to be facing away from the stage. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So Bedford comes to mind. When, when I was there, and Alan Francis was on, and there was a guy who's absolutely just off his tits, and we couldn't work out why he was there, how he'd gone. He just walked in with no ticket. <laughs> um, and I eventually managed to pin him against an exit door away from the stage, you know, in another room. I can't remember who was with me at the time, but they were all keeping well away from me. <laughs> well, I'm putting this absolute loony against the door. The police arrived and said, oh, yeah, he's escaped from a prison. And he had a knife. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, Yeah. But the amount of times you do turn up to a lot of those places that are run in hotels and they've got the big round tables and the chairs, but they won't allow them on the dance floor, which is oh. in front of the stage. Yeah. No, mate, no. That's 3,000 quid's worth of floor, that is. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, I, as, a, as a musician years ago, one of my gigs, I used to do the tea dances at the Ritz. It was oh, a, wow, a piano, wow. 
piano trio, piano, bass and drums. So Alex Dankworth was on bass for this one. He turns up at the, you know, turns up about half three to start at four. And we've all got to wear tux, not tux, but, you know, um, dinner jacket, whatever. And uh, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he turns up with his double bass and a little piece of carpet about that big, about four inches by four inches. That's about seven centimetres tall, you non-esteemed people out there. And um, <laughs> so he, he proceeds to put this little square of carpet down on the dance floor at, at the Ritz. And the maitre d' comes and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm putting this little bit of... He says, why are you doing that? This is the Ritz. He says, well, it saves the... Um, the spike of the double bass going and, and creating a divot in the dance floor. We don't have bits of carpet here, put it away, you know. So a Alex proceeded to get his double bass out. They go, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> 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 Alan Barnes, who's a very well-known um, saxophone player, was on it once as well. I think he got the sack because we'd get this 15-minute break while the piano player, Jeremy Westwood, who was this incredible player, and nobody had ever heard of, knew every song in the book and played brilliantly. We'd get 15 minutes off. We'd play for four till, uh, sorry, uh, four till four fifty, uh, 5.15, get 15 minutes off and then play 5.30 to 6.30. And in the 15 minutes, he'd have to play for a, a singer, a cabaret singer, and we'd get shifted into a side room where we could eat anything that was on the tables that other people hadn't eaten. Food cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cucumber sandwiches, all this stuff from the tip. So we're in black and white dinner jackets. So we'd come out for the second set, and Alan Barnes would be covered in cream and sugar. Mm. <laughs> Had as many cream as he could get. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> Do you think there's a real strong connection between musicians and stand up comedy? Because a lot of us seem to be, you know, musical or come from music and got yeah, into yeah. comedy. Both of you probably know this. I would much rather spend my time with musicians in that little room <laughs> than comics. <you> know. <laughs> comics are psychopaths. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. Paranoid psychopaths. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the funniest things you'll ever see in that room is uh, when we, uh, we used to do a lot more of them, but... Um, we some, still do Jewish nights, nights with just Jewish performers or for a Jewish charity or something like that. You should hear the passive aggression in that room with four <laughs> Jewish acts on. Because they, well, they're always saying, all right, Bob, yeah, so, I hear you struggled the other night. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's just all little things. Oh, you know, you are, oh, it's a tough room, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so musicians, I think there's a, I don't know, I think there's a, Especially if you play, you know, in modern music, uh, you know, pop or blues or even to some extent country, but certainly jazz, there's an element of being able to just make stuff happen. Uh, you don't need the dots. Mm. And I think musicians and comics share that, you know. In, in the early days, there certainly seemed to be a, a, a link between folk musicians and comedy didn't they i mean lots of uh, billy Connolly, oh, jasper carrots as was the case you know with um harding mike hard was it mike mike harding. Yeah, yeah, mike harding. you know they, they'd do a few songs and then find that the the, the chat between the songs was getting you know bigger, bigger and bigger now yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah i think it was the same thing it was, but then the, the folk circuit was was certainly the precursor for comedy clubs you know yeah rooms above behind pubs you know in village halls and a little circuit, people playing to people who were not paying too much to, to see somebody do something, you know, close up. So is there any things that you wish you knew before you started <laughs> promoting? <laughs> any words you know of advice what? that you wish I, someone I, gave you? Uh, I, luckily, I, uh, this, this showbiz family thing I mentioned earlier sort of puts a good head on you because you don't, you're not unrealistic about what, what it is, you know. I mean, I, there's so many people I've met, you know, dying to get into television or, or whatever, and then you find out that you're at the studios at Maidstone and it's just a concrete block, you know, mm. or, or the TV centre, which was just a soulless place, you know, an office block with, with eight 
big rooms in the basement that were made out of concrete. You know, <clears throat> it's not glamorous. It's not pretty. The number one dressing room at the at the Palladium is fucking awful. You know, it's <sighs> so. I had that from going following my father around these places as a child, just knowing that it was just business, show business. I've learned on the job. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes. You know, I don't think I've, I don't think I'd do anything differently. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And I think you just treat people with respect and uh, and and try and help them. And I know it sounds trite, but uh, I think that if you do a two-hour show and for those two hours people forget what they're doing for the rest of the day and what their problems are. You've actually done what you're there to do as, as a performer as a, and specifically as a comic, you know? I mean, it's talking of which, I mean, what, what do you, what do you reckon are amongst the favorite comics that you've seen? on stage? Oh dear. This is a question I've always asked. I know. It has to be uh, Paul Ricketts and Stephen Gribbin. Well, of course. <laughs> of yeah, course. Yeah. Whatever happened to them? <laughs> well one of them is still going <laughs> yeah <laughs> which one i don't know i, I still i it's like uh like all old gits you still go back to instances which were exciting i mean I, yeah seeing andrew bailey on form was just yeah. a different thing altogether oh, he's fantastic you know, as Podomowski, making something happen with two bits of Weetabix and a tennis racket, you know, it's, oh, but, he, he, but chaos was part of that. I mean, one of the last times I, he did the King's Head, he rang me up at eight o'clock the next morning in a terrible panic. And I said, what is it, Andrew? And he said, I, I left my bit of wood there. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, can you not get another bit? He said, no, 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 no. It's one of my favourite bits. <laughs> I had to, I had to, uh, I had to go and find this piece of wood and put it to one side, and he had to come collect it. You know. I mean, there's the, the the obverse of that, of course, is uh, I mean, what have been amongst the most disastrous or uh, calamitous? Yes. Nights? Did, did I ever tell you about the one that Hugh and I remember this so well? Uh, we still can't remember his name. I think it was Domino or something. It was guy on a Thursday night, uh, which is our tryout night. I arrived at the venue to set up. He's already there with his wife and two semi-grown-up children in their early 20s, I imagine. In his late 50s, mid-50s, and he was a vent act. And he was sorting things out and trying bits out with this horrible, horrible doll that had just been bought off the shelf, you know. And I, I, I was chatting and I was setting up and saying, you know, what do you need? He says, so, so, two mics. <laughs> 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 I thought, okay, all right. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's going to do this. <laughs> Good enough. Oh, God. And as he's talking, he's telling us about this he says, all my life, I've wanted to be in show business. I've wanted to be a vent act. And he's telling me his day job is whatever it is. You know, works for a paint factory and he's finally retired. And then we set up, we open up, the audience comes in and Hugh introduces the act. So we've got five minutes each. He comes up, put the extra mic out and out he comes and pulls his horrid doll out the bag and gets the doll up, you know, to one of the mics and him on the other and proceeds to do one of the funniest opening three minutes we've ever seen in our life. Hugh and I were crying with laughter uh, as everything was reversed. Every time the doll talked, so did he. And, <laughs> and he was talking, it was like this. Everything was the wrong way around. And it was just so brilliant and so funny. And the whole audience was in fits of laughter. And then it slowly dawned on everybody that this wasn't by design. <laughs> no. And then he starts to shout at the doll, You fucker, you've done this to me. <laughs> and then the children and his wife start saying, Derek, stop it, Derek. <laughs> and he's going, You bastard doll, you fucker. And he throws the doll in the bag, you know, in the, in the case, shuts the case, and just disappears up the stairs, followed by his family, all saying, Dad. Dad, Dad, leave it, leave it like this. We never saw him again. Oh. And I, I still 
think about it. I don't know whether it was a brilliant piece of performance art. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Which it could be. Or the most brilliant meltdown ever. It was fantastic. That's I'll never brilliant. forget that. Hugh, does, Hugh will tell you about it as well. Yeah. Now that you said that, next week probably a little tap at the window of that little. Yeah. It'll be it'll be the doll. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> what was that you said? <laughs> and yeah, and, and if you're going to ask me the other one, one of the the opposite of that was uh, something that happened. You know, not that long ago, Kevin McAleer came down, hadn't seen oh. him for years, and uh, he just said, "I just want to work this thing in." And he, Stuart Lee was standing with me at the back because Stuart's a big uh, fan, you know. And Kevin proceeded to do a 40-minute monologue, which was, he was just like this all the time, just straight to the mic, and then a couple of times to the left and a couple of times to the right. And uh, and the story just seemed to be like a, a non-sequitur story. But, and then suddenly at about 42 minutes in, all these strands came together in the biggest and most sustained laugh you've ever heard in front of wow. 70, 80 people. Yeah. And Stuart will tell you this as well now. He was on the floor and couldn't get up because it was just such a beautiful piece of construction from a great – I mean, you remember Kevin. Uh, he was such a – he's brilliant. Did you ever see him, Paul? No, before my time. One of the things he used to do before he started talking, really, he used to do a show with owls and a pointy stick – yeah, and he just have pictures of owls. Yeah, and he just just put pointed an owl, and then just look at the audience. And then he didn't have another owl, and he'd point at that. That was the act. <laughs> I mean, what is your favourite sort of comedy, then, Peter? What's your favourite sort? I, that's what I say. I, you know, I think it's when things happen that you don't expect to happen. You know, and it's the same as with a surprise gag. You know, hmm. it's where it comes out you don't expect it. To be that that to be the answer you know i i mean there's a joke, barry cries last joke that he was telling everybody I, it's a great example partly of barry but also of that of how something just comes out of nowhere Did, you know you know the guy stuck on the desert island with angela jolly you know yes. so he's he's on his he's stuck on the island just the two of them and you know eventually one thing leads to another and they make love you know and in the morning they wake up both naked you know and he says Angela, can I ask a favour? And and she says, what? She says, can I, can I draw a little moustache underneath your nose? And she goes, oh, okay, I suppose so, that's all right. She says, and, and can I call you Frank? She goes, oh, oh, okay, all right, yeah, you can call me Frank. She goes, all right. She says, Frank, you never guess who I'm shagging. <laughs> Describe the Crouch End audience. What are they like? Entitled. Yes, I'd go with that. It has changed radically. I mean, when we started, it was Bedsit Land. We had a Hornsey uh, College of Art up the road. Now, a garage is going to cost you more than two. the two of your houses are put together. Mm. You know, uh, it's, it's a different world. Everybody's got money. Let's say the 30-year-olds now who come to us are still living at home with mummy and daddy and have a disposable ink disposable income yeah yeah um, so there is a bit of that um it's always been a bit right on there you know this part we used to call it part of the humus triangle <laughs> <laughs> it's not like the jerry lee triangle yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's just always been a bit sort of uh knit your own yogurty and it, but they're our audience and uh we we know them and we like them you know I mean, what, what advice would you give to comics for approaching them? You know, how should they approach? Just think what you're doing. And the amount of times people ring me up and say, uh, or, well, uh, or I'll do your club. And you go, okay, uh, uh, what's your name? Oh, uh, Dave, you know. And you go, all right, okay. So let's, 16th of March. You go, okay, thanks. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> 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 And then, they, you know, think about it. Just be polite. Tell us your name, your, your telephone number, say what you want to do. We can talk it through. You know, I have this thing that everybody says is ridiculous about still wanting to do it on the phone. I do it on the phone because it's faster. I don't have to go emails backwards and forwards saying, oh, I can't do that. I can do this. Oh, that yeah. one's just gone. And, and secondly, I do it in the mornings because it saves the phone going all day. 
And I also think that people who bother to get up and do it, then they're showing they're serious about it. I was just about to say that because most comics don't get up before about 10 o'clock, do they? Well, yeah, no. but you'll, you'll also see that most of the successful comics are, are working. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're writing something or they're, they're you know. Yeah, it's true. So should we put your number in the description or will we just let... Um, just new- put a, a link. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, what was the first live comedy club you actually went to yourself? Uh, the, you were King's Head. Uh, the, the King's Head. Really? Yeah, yeah. So you didn't uh, go to the store or any of the no, other... No, I didn't know anything. I didn't even know that scene existed. Do you remember who was on that the bill in the, the early days? Oh, the, God, the, yes, it would have been... John Sparks and uh, we'd have people like Melanie Harold and and singer songwriters alongside musicians, yeah. uh, alongside comedians. You know, um, yeah, it would they were variety bills. It wasn't straightforward comedy. You know? Well, I think we're running out of time. Yeah, we've got a minute, so let's uh, you know, I f- thank Peter for uh, for furnishing us with his presence at this podcast well do you know it's been a pleasure it's one of the few times i've had to use this zoom thing where i've been allowed to keep my clothes on yeah <laughs> well you, you're gonna earn a lot less money than you did for the last time but yeah I, I, nothing's happening yeah ching ching nothing of that is happening no but uh, obviously you're gonna make more men happy by keeping your clothes on <laughs> Now, draw a moustache on it. No, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure, actually, Peter. It's been really good. So, big thanks there to uh, Peter Graham for that fantastic interview. Always great Woo-hoo. to listen to Peter and some of the oldest jokes you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest joke in Britain. <laughs> yes, it's amazing that he's a, he's a promoter who isn't a performer, but sometimes he's funnier than the, uh, the performers are. <laughs> Yeah, especially at the little tiny booth to the side of the stage. It's amazing that even in this little cubby hole, uh, he can hear not only what the acts are doing on stage, which is about uh, 25 feet away, uh, yeah. and there's a window and a wall in the way. He can hear exactly what's going on. He can also hear who's actually coming down, downstairs into the king's head. He can hear people, you know, 20 foot away. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you, can, you can hear a comic die <laughs> while he's making other comics laugh. What's our comedy lexicon word for today, then? What is comedy it? lexicon word for today is Jonah. Oh, Jonah. Yes. So yeah. what is a Jonah? Um, a Jonah is, it's a comic who their presence are either on the bill or even in the audience guarantees your death that is a jonah <laughs> it's exact it is it's absolutely true and uh, all comics will know it, it doesn't make any empirical sense but you know on the level of uh, superstition we all believe in it don't we we all yeah. think that we've got if you see their name you just go oh for god's sake that's it. I was really looking forward to that gig this weekend, but now I'm guaranteed I'm going to stiff. We've also been Jonas for other people. Oh, and it's, it's, it's terrible <laughs> when you're the Jonah. Because I was a Jonah to a, 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 an act who's now given up. Oh, God. And I think I might have been at that last gig that he did. And even <laughs> we were discussing it, he's going, every time, every time, Paul, you're there, I'm always, I always die. I said, look, I know, but it's, look, it's, you know it doesn't make any sense. It's Tonight will be great. And it uh, wasn't. Yeah, Jonas, they, yeah, it's a terrible thing. But it's, it uh, is. It, it's, it's awful to be a Jonah and it's awful to have a Jonah. It, no, there's, no, there's no enjoyable aspect to it at all. I that mean, says a lot about comics mindset, doesn't it? It's always the negative, you know, because yes. we've always got comedy clubs, one bogey club or even a bogey town or city. Yeah, yeah. I played there like 30 times and every time it was a pain in the arse. And it just... I mean, the logical uh, step would be to avoid playing there, but, you know, <laughs> comics are always like, oh, at this time, this time it's going to be different. Yeah, and well, it, it should be. It's uh, yeah, And the other thing is, you, you know, when you're in car journeys and uh, comics are telling you about, oh, no, I always die in Bournemouth, as you're driving to Bournemouth, yeah. and, uh, and they tell you all the stories of how they've died in Bournemouth, uh, and then, you know, even on the journey, you're saying, perhaps you should stop talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got inside your head. Yeah. And go, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And of course, <laughs> go out and die in Bournemouth. That's exactly what will happen. Yeah. 
That's what does happen. Yeah, it's a big sign outside the town saying Bournemouth twinned with Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think that's a good good way to yeah. finish this particular episode. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, if you've enjoyed this, uh, you know, uh, there will be a YouTube thing. So like and subscribe that and, uh, you know, tell other people uh, to uh, download this podcast. And um, we'll see you on the next one. Yay. They said you shouldn't have been here last week.